In some ways, Tim's book reminds me of Alex de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. In Tocqueville's words, America provided the most complete and peaceful development of democracy, and he wanted to discern clearly its natural consequences and to know what we ought to hope and fear from it. Where had it gone right, where had it gone wrong, and where might it go wrong? And so it is with Tim's book. Tocqueville and Tim Carney both zero in on the individual and his relationship to his community. Both examine the dynamics that draw the human person outward to socialize, network, and bond with others. And to form the great mediating institutions of society. Both note the importance of the church in the formation of the person and the development of community. Both warn of the danger that democracy without more will facilitate, as Tim calls it, hyper-individualism. And both, both address the benefits of the local ex exercise of power. In the words of Tocqueville, local freedoms which make many citizens put value on the affection of their neighbors, therefore constantly bring men closer to one another, despite the instincts that separate them. Both works make it clear that to use the language of Catholic social doctrine, subsidiarity, fully exercised, leads to solidarity. Like any good story, Alienated America is a captivating read. Of more importance, it provides keen insight into and proposes solutions to our domestic ills. Tim is a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and serves concurrently uh, as a commentator, commentary editor of the Washington Examiner. He, was a he is a graduate of St. John's College in Annapolis, and he and his family are parishioners at St. Andrew Apostle Catholic Church. Timothy Carney, welcome to the Catholic University of America. Thank you very much. Thank all of you guys uh, for, for coming out tonight. You know you are in a Catholic crowd when nobody wants to sit in the front row. So this is a, uh, a very home, home place for me. So I wrote Alienated America because um, I have a, a story to tell. It's a, a story about the American dream and particularly the widely held belief that the American dream is dead. So it's a story about family, a story about work, a story about community, a story about faith, and yes, a story about solidarity and, and subsidiarity. Um, it's also a story about how Donald Trump became the president of the United States. And because I'm a political reporter, my story begins in Iowa. And because I am an Irish Catholic, my story begins in a bar. It was... <clears throat> It was Joe's place in Iowa City. It was a few weeks before the 2016 Iowa caucuses. I met this couple, worked at the university, and the woman said she was from Orange City, Iowa. And I'd been all over Iowa and going back to the, the 2004 cycle since I was covering Howard Dean. And so, but I'd never been to Orange City. And I was intrigued by the name, because again, as an Irish Catholic, if you know Irish history, the color orange can be a little triggering. And so I said, so what, what's, what is orange about this place? I wanted to know if it was a bunch of Ulstermen marching down the streets every, every July. But no, she said, no, we're orange because of, we're Dutch. And again, I'm from New York, so ethnicity is a real thing. And so I wanted to know, how Dutch are you? So this woman... Her name was Holly Vander something. She said, I would, let me put it this way. We used to wear wooden clogs marching past Windmill Square for the annual Tulip Festival. And this, this was not in the Netherlands. This was in northwestern Iowa. And it was like, she went on. I thought she was like, it was a joke. I thought it was like a Simpsons episode send up of Dutch people in the Midwest. So I had to, I had to go out there. So I traveled out there to Sioux County, Iowa, where Orange City is. It is the Duchess County in all of America. I went to Sioux Center, another the uh, county seat in, uh, in Sioux County. I attended a Jeb Bush rally at a Christian coll college called Dort College. And yes, the Dutchness there was overwhelming. The first woman I met was named Wilhelmina, and she proudly explained that uh, Wilhelmina was a queen of the Netherlands throughout both world wars. The other thing I encountered in Sioux County, in Orange City and Sioux Center, was 
And again, this is during the caucuses. So this, I'm not talk, when I talk about politics here, I'm not talking about the general election. I'm not talking about 2020. I'm not talking about Hillary versus Trump. I'm talking about when there were 17 people all competing to be the Republican nominee. What I found in Sioux County was an immense antipathy and disinterest in Donald Trump. There was one questioner who, when asking a question about Trump, called him a candidate with the initials DT, would not even use his name. There was one pastor who said, I have 900 people in my pews every Sunday. I know of one who's going to support Trump in the Iowa caucuses. And sure enough, this was Donald Trump's single worst county in all of Iowa. The Dutchess County in America was Trump's worst county in the Republican caucuses. He got 11% there compared to about 27% statewide. But it wasn't just Sioux County. It's the two of his five worst counties, the other two included the two, the second and third Dutchess counties in the state, Marion County, uh, where Pella, Iowa is, and Lyon County, right next door to Sioux County. So we political commentators always talk about a Hispanic vote or a black vote or, or you know, the evangelical vote. Apparently there was something called the Dutch vote. And it was conservative Republicans who resisted Donald Trump. I had to figure out what was going on. Um, I, asked, I actually asked Ted Cruz at one point in, uh, in Michigan, because I, Western Michigan has Holland, Michigan, okay? So this is the Dutchess part of America. And, but I asked Ted Cruz, I said, so why are you winning all these, these Dutch places? Why are you doing so well? And he said, well, Tim, Dutch people, you met them, they're nice. Donald's not nice. They want a nice guy. And I was thinking, like Ted Cruz? I mean, <laughs> I, I like him, but of all the things you think about, you don't think, you know, nice, nice down-home guy. Um, one person posited to me that the Dutch were upset that Trump was appropriating the color orange. I don't think that that was true. So I had to go out to Holland, Michigan and the rest of Western Michigan. And sure enough, Trump's worst county in Michigan was the Dutchess County in Michigan, Ottawa, which is where Holland is. And the five counties Ted Cruz won over there were the five Dutch counties. So what was going on? Back in Dork College in Iowa, I had spoken to the husband of a professor and he had said, um, out here in Orange, in Orange County, I mean in uh, Orange City, they vote right but live left. I thought, whoa, that's kind of interesting. What did he mean? Like, was I on to a really big story? Was this some, you know, den of pot smoking swingers in the middle of the Great Plains? But he said, no, that's just what you do. You care about your neighbors, you care about your environment, but you also take care of it yourself and don't rely on the government. So I got over my annoyance at him describing caring about your neighbors as living left, but I knew exactly what he meant. There was an immense sense of duty to one's neighbor, an immense sense of social trust and social cohesion in all these places like Holland and Orange City. Um, and a New Yorker profile in 2017 of Orange City channeled the arguments of the, the people there who were trying to convince you know, the, the kids who go off to college, then telling them to come back. The argument is there are plenty of jobs. It'll take you five minutes to drive to work. When you have children, we'll help you take care of them. People here share your values. It's a good Christian place and they care about you. If anything happens, they'll have your back. So it was starting to become clear to me what was happening between Iowa and Michigan. The, place, the man who went on stage in mid-2015 and declared the American dream is dead was doing very poorly in the places where the American dream was most alive. So leading up to the Wisconsin primary, I visited Oostburg, Wisconsin, a village that's about 50% Dutch. I got there on a Sunday morning, planted myself at Judy's Diner, and the explanation then became perfectly clear to me, and it should have been clear earlier. Because as I was sitting there at the diner, the families came pouring in from the 9 a.m. services at First Reformed Church and the Bethel Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Then, a few minutes later, the families came pouring in from the 915 at First Presbyterian Church and then the 930 services at First Christian Reformed Church. Oostburg is a village of 2,000. It has four churches just within the tradition of Reformed Christianity. There's also other churches in addition to that, but just within this Calvinist tradition, four churches bustling with families in this village of 2,000. Throughout the day, I learned many of them would go back again that night for a second service or Bible study around 6 p.m. 
So the thing that made these Dutch communities so strong was not the, the Dutch blood, but was the, Dutch, was the churches and the Christian schools and the other institutions that spun out of those churches too. These reformed churches had planted themselves around the country and built not just churches, they were planting communities, hardy, robust, tightly knit communities that were able to fend off the afflictions that have hit so much of middle America, so much of rural America, which is the inequality, the retreat from marriage, the out of wedlock births, the drugs, and the deaths of despair. And of course, it wasn't just the Dutch. Trump's second worst state in the Republican primaries was Utah. His worst counties in the whole country were the Mormon counties in Utah and Idaho. But also, um, as uh, any of you who are local know, um, you can also see it closer to home. So I looked at a precinct map of Silver Spring, where I live. In the Republican primaries, again, Donald Trump won all of Silver Spring. Ted Cruz won two precincts right near my house. So uh, near my house in Silver Spring, there's this one street that kind of curves up like this, Arcola Avenue, another street that goes up like this, Kemp Mill Boulevard. On both Arcola and Kemp Mill are Orthodox synagogues. Around each of them is an election precinct. Ted Cruz dominated the Republican primaries in those two precincts and basically those two precincts alone in Silver Spring. So this, and uh, Orthodox uh, teachings, you can't drive on the Sabbath. So you have to live within walking distance of, of your house of worship. So what these rules have done is they've formed immensely tightly knit, intimate communities of a shared religion, of shared purpose, where people, again, feel the American dream is alive. That's the environment in which the American dream is thriving the most. So my, my wife and I, we live there. We have, we have six kids. A funny thing about living in that neighborhood with six kids is people make certain assumptions when you show up. So you walk into the grocery store with six kids in our neighborhood, and they send you to the kosher food aisle, which is better than if you walk into the same grocery, you know, with six kids in, in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and they send you to the family planning aisle. Um, <clears throat> but Chevy Chase is where I went next in my uh, reporting. The same day that Cruz carried those Orthodox precincts, uh, I spent the morning down the road at Chevy Chase, Maryland, the village of Chevy Chase, to be precise. A lot of you guys may know there's different Chevy Chases. Brett Kavanaugh, he's from a sort of lesser Chevy Chase, the town of Chevy Chase. And then there's, oh no, he's from Chevy Chase section five. I don't know if there's a sections one through four, but he's from Chevy Chase section five, which is only really, really rich. The village of Chevy Chase is the wealthiest municipality in this whole region. This region, by some measures, is the wealthiest municipality in this country, which is, of course, the wealthiest country in the history of the world. So like the village of Oostburg, the village of Chevy Chase has about 2,000 people. While the average home in Oostburg costs about 150000 the average home in Chevy Chase costs about $1.5 million. Mean household income there is, uh, in, in, the, in the village, is four point, uh, no, the mean income is 420000 a year. So Donald Trump, who got 54% statewide in my state of Maryland in the Republican primaries, got only 16% in the primaries in Chevy Chase. The elites were rejecting Donald Trump. Um, in addition to losing Western Michigan, with, where the Dutch people are, Trump also lost Gross Point in Ann Arbor. Just as he couldn't get even 20% in Sioux and Marion County, he also couldn't get 20% in Iowa in Johnson and Story County, Iowa, which are two of the most of the 20 most educated counties in all of America. South of Oostburg, Trump's worst counties in Wisconsin were the educated, suburban, wealthy Waukesha, Ozaki, and Washington counties. So again. Across the nation, when not, not, a, not being asked Trump versus Hillary, but his earliest base, the earliest people who came out for him, were largely people who didn't vote before. They were people who never saw a point in politics, and they suddenly came out for him in a lot of Iowa, in most of Michigan, in half of Wisconsin, and most of Maryland. And those were the people who believed the American dream is dead. Those people were not either in these religious places or in these elite places. And so I want to talk a little bit about the elite places before I get into the politics a little more. I'm going to address something I call the Lena Dunham fallacy. So Lena Dunham is an actress and a screenwriter, and she wrote a, a show called Girls, and it's a pretty depraved show. Um, and there's, uh, I think she went to Ivy League school or Wesleyan or something, and so there's this belief among many of my fellow religious conservatives 
that when you say liberal elite, they get an image of a graduate from Wesleyan who then graduates, walks out with her, you know, feminist literature in hand, decides um, a woman needs a man no more than a fish needs a bicycle. They become swingers, they eschew marriage, and they hate children. This isn't true. Conservatives fall into this fallacy because they see falling marriage rates and rising rates of out-of-wedlock births, and they blame it on the, the liberal elites. But if that liberal guy in Sioux County, Iowa, could say that the, the folks out there vote right but live left, I'm a conservative guy from Montgomery County, so I'm going to say Chevy Chase votes left, but it lives right. About 95% of Chevy Chase's families had two-parent homes in 2015. The Village Hall hosts father-daughter dances multiple times a year with Scottish Pipers. People finish school, get jobs, get married, have kids, stay married, get involved in their kids' lives, and then stay involved in the community. The data on the elites nationwide, this isn't just Chevy Chase, tell this story. While 50% of babies born to working class moms are born out of wedlock, it's only 10% of the babies born to college educated moms are born out of wedlock. If you are a parent in the upper third of income, your children are half as likely to have an, a child out of wedlock as the children of the parents in the lower third. College educated men are more likely to get married and half as likely to get divorced. So what, what I say is this, the liberal elites are practicing what we conservative Catholics are preaching. So now it looks like we've got two different types of places that have some similarities, right? Oosberg and Chevy Chase. Both have strong families, both rejected Trump, but they seem pretty different, right? I would argue that they are, in fact, not two different phenomena, but they are one. Both of these places where the American dream is alive are the places where many overlapping institutions of civil society form communities that are strong because they are planted thick with institutions that connect people to one another. And this is where the American dream is most alive, where people belong to things that give them a sense of purpose and a human level safety net. A wise woman once put it this way, it takes a village to raise a child. Both the village of Oostburg and the village of Chevy Chase qualify as that village. Where these institutions are, whether it's the churches in Oostburg or the public schools and the country clubs in Chevy Chase, the American dream is alive. But in much of the countries, these institutions are fading. And they're anemic, if not completely gone. So the affliction of the working class and the middle class in America is this. Too many places have too few institutions of civil society. Too many people are trying to raise families or advance their lives in places where there's not enough to belong to. They're left feeling alienated, lacking a human level safety net and a sense of purpose. They're lacking connection and modeling and thus they're lacking access to the good life. That's the thesis of alienated America. And, um, and I think that I, I can argue it pretty thoroughly. And I'm just gonna give you guys a little bit of an overview. But first I wanna talk briefly about what community does. And this has to be done because when you're speaking to a college crowd, so many of us in this room, I'm trying to describe to you what it's like to breathe air. In other words, if you ended up in college, the odds are you were raised in a community where you belong to little leagues and choirs where you went to a, a strong school, either a Catholic school or a public school, where parents were involved, where um, neighbors looked out for one another. That's not necessarily most of America. So what do these institutions do? The first thing is they provide a safety net. So the foreword of my book is about, <clears throat> from something that happened exactly two years ago uh, today. I was in, it was, well, two years ago this last Sunday. Um, our, our youngest was one year old. Her name is Eve. She was getting sick. And sort of the thing about kids when they're one, usually our kids are not that cuddly. And like when she had a cold, it was kind of nice because now she was cuddling with you. And, uh, but she was sick, and so we did the, what we call the divide and conquer on Sunday morning which is to say, I went to the early mass with some kids and my wife goes to the later mass with other kids. And the baby just stays at home the whole time. So 
during the 1130 mass, I'm holding Eve, and she's going from sort of lethargic to looking really bad. And luckily, we had one of those pulse oximeter things that they have at the hospital, and it leads her, reads her blood alcohol, uh, not blood alcohol content, <laughs> her blood oxygen content. I'm going to need one of those when Lucy and Charlie turn 16, I'll tell you. Um, no, it's uh, blood oxygen uh, concentration, and it was weighed down far too low. And my wife had the car at mass, and so I'm calling her. But you know, her phone's on do not disturb in her purse, she's not answering. And so uh, we had a jogging stroller. I don't even know where this jogging stroller came from. I think this, this was some sort of divine intervention. And so I put even the jogging stroller, I turned to my then 10 or nine year old Charlie, I say, you're in charge, and I start sprinting down Georgia Avenue to the urgent care center. We get there and um, and at that point, it's, uh, they're like, we can't get her enough oxygen in her lungs to, to help her. you got to get her to the emergency room. So then we go down to Holy Cross, where five of our six children were born. Yeah, our machines can't do it. The only machines in this whole place that can get enough oxygen into her lungs because she has RSV, which is a really bad respiratory disease, is Children's Hospital. So then the ambulance takes my wife and, uh, and Eve down to Children's Hospital. After about 24 hours, we realize Eve is going to be perfectly fine, but it's going to take about a week to get her to the point where she can breathe without this machine. So then it was just this long, exhausting slog of feeling so horrible for this one-year-old who had to sleep in like a cage of a crib. And for ourselves, one of us would always be there, so we were often sleeping in the, in the little room. And we weren't going to let Eve be alone, so we're trading off. During this time... We would call on friends to watch the kids, the other five kids, while we're traveling back and forth, to sort of break all the carpool rules and take them off to school. Um, and then people started showing up with food, and tons of food. And my son, when he read the forward to the book, said, you should have, written the, you should have included the part about lunch. I said, what about the part about lunch? I said, I included that they brought food. He said, no, for that one week at the Heights, we had the best lunch in the whole lower school. For that one week, we ate really well. Now, I'm the guy who makes the lunches the other day, so I I'm, you know, didn't necessarily take that as a compliment. But yet, somebody had brought a corner bakery feast that lasted so long, I think some of it went bad. We gave it away to our other neighbors. But I was describing to the nurses there, what was going on, why so much stuff was coming into us. I said, oh, that, that came from a, a guy I work with at the examiner. That came from a friend at our parish. That came from somebody at our, our swimming, uh, swim club. That came from somebody at our boys' school. That came from somebody at our daughter's school. And I realized every person I was describing, it wasn't just a friendship. There was an institution that connected us, that these hubs were really what formed for us the safety net. And when I was trying to call my wife and she eventually looked at her text messages and she ran out mid-mass and then our oldest, Lucy, was with her and Lucy said, should I come? And my wife just turned to her and said, no, just go find somebody who will give you a ride home. Pointed to a friend's mom, Dory. I bet Dory will give you a ride home. And if not, somebody else will. That in some ways is my favorite uh, detail from that story, was that we belong to this thing, it's a parish, where we could just say, fully trust the most important things to us and just say, somebody will get you home safely. So much of America doesn't have that human level safety net. And it's not just what's below us, it's also what's above us. Institutions of civil society give us a sense of purpose. Raj Chetty is a researcher with Stanford and Harvard, an economist. He studied economic mobility, what allows people to do better than their parents, et cetera. This is one of the definitions of American dream, right? He found the likelihood a child would do better economically than his or her parents varied immensely across place. So what defined the places, like Salt Lake City, where there was massive upward mobility? And what defined the places, like the Charlotte area, where there was very little chance that a child would do better than their parents? So he did all that economist stuff, multivariable regression analyses, etc. He found that controlling for, like, everything, things like... Uh, classroom size or money spent per pupil or other things like that had a small positive effect on upward mobility. The two biggest factors were the percentage of intact families in the neighborhood, uh, two parents at home, and the uh, various measures of social capital. How much volunteering, how many clubs did people belong to, how many churches were open, etc. So civil society is what fuels upward mobility. 
the little platoons that we belong to are the beating heart of the American dream. So then the next question is, what's going on in the place where the American dream seems dead? So part of my job is something I've called bar reporting, not just Joe's place in, in Iowa City, but other bars where you go and you start talking to people and eventually they start spilling their guts about politics. Um, but some bars are, diff are better than others, right? So you go to a college bar and they're all from out of town and none of them vote. Sorry, it's not, not really a good place to do political reporting. Hotel bar, they're all from out of town. Um, what I found the sweet spot was what I called yuppie Irish pubs. You sit down there, you had liberals, you had conservatives, Republicans, Democrats, men, women, old, young, it was great. What I stopped doing after 2004 was what I call roadside country bars. These are the places, there's not like a parking lot, there's not even like a curb cutout. You drive up on the curb, park in front of the place. There's no windows on the, on the whole front of the place, so it's kind of creepy when you walk in and if, if you don't belong, everybody just kind of stares at you silently. But I still tried to do it and everybody would just say, politics is a bunch of BS and I don't care about it. And the conversation would end. Well. In 2016, it was a little different. I walked into those bars and they said, politics is a bunch of BS and that's why I'm supporting Donald Trump for president. So one of these places, uh, Fayette County, Pennsylvania. I found Fayette County because I'd looked at a study of where church attendance had dropped off among, in, uh, among evangelicals and Catholics in the state of Pennsylvania and Fayette was up at the top of there. And so I went out there, I found a, a bar called Smitty's and again, it's not just that there's no windows on the front, it's that to walk in, you have to walk into this little antechamber where there's carpeting on like the doors and the walls. So there's this moment of pitch black silence. It's kind of like a hip speakeasy, but it's kind of the exact opposite. And then you walk into the bar. And I was at Smitty's um, and while I was there and before I could get the people start talking to me, you have to sit there for a little while. Um, I did some research and I found that it was in the top two on unemployment, top two on men having dropped out of the labor force, top two in all sorts of bad economic indicators. Again, I had landed there because of the drop off in church attendance and then I learned about the economic. And, and they're talking and the politics is what you'd expect. First of all, Uniontown, where Smitty's is in Fayette County, is pretty diverse. I would guess it's probably about 30% black, 20% Hispanic, but the clientele at Smitty's is 100% white. The, the pretty, in some ways, a, a segregated town. And everybody in there was supporting Donald Trump. Most of them didn't normally vote. And then you talk to them about the economy and they always say two contradictory things. They say, oh, well, there are no jobs. And then they say, there's nobody here who would actually do any work. Everybody's lazy around here. And they tell the stories about the men on disability who don't need it, the men who are using their food stamps to so then buy drugs. There's the same third-hand stories about welfare abuse in every town you go to in this country. Oh, well, there's this lady walked up and she tried to buy dog food with her food stamps and the guy wouldn't let her, so she went over to the meat aisle and grabbed a T-bone steak and said, I guess Fido's eating well tonight. And again, I heard that in multiple towns and it was always, oh, my neighbor's wife saw this story. So these stories go on and there's a, a racial undercurrent to the stories. But I, I eventually asked this one, when I look around, I'm saying, this is complaints about unworking, lazy people in a bar at 2.30 on a Tuesday. And yes, I was in the bar at 2.30 on a Tuesday, but this was literally my job. Um, but I turned to this one guy, I said, Dave, why don't, you do, why don't you work? And he said, well, I can't, my back. Excruciating tales of excruciating back pain and surgery. I say, so the jobs around here, it's all, uh, it's all manual, there's no desk jobs. He said, no, I can't sit at a desk for half an hour. And I said, Dave, you've been sitting at this bar for about an hour and a half since I've been here. And he says, well, I'm numb today because my son died this morning. So the, the data that I knew was true about so much of rural America, the things I was looking to explain, suddenly staring me right in the eye. And the explanations that you sometimes get in the political press, that, oh, well, this isn't real suffering, this is just you know, straight white men upset that they've lost their privilege or that all the, the only problem is they don't have enough money uh, and good jobs, that all those explanations fell grossly short. I realized that something far deeper than economics or anything like that w was broken in these places. Um, and yeah, Fayette County's overdose death rate, 57 
per 100,000. That's 50% higher than Pennsylvania's average, which itself is twice the national average, which itself is rising to like record highs. Suicides hit a record high in the United States last year. Um, suicide rates by state, if you look, an interesting detail is that they're inversely proportional to population density, meaning the fewer people you live around, the more likely you are to take your life. Psychiatrist Aaron Cariety explained the rise in white middle-aged suicide specifically this way. We're not living in community anymore. We're living in isolation and we don't have people to provide meaning and give hope. And other health issues, heart disease, et cetera, seem to stem from being socially disconnected. And of course, opioids, the opioid e epidemic, a lot of people talk about the supply side of that, the drug companies, et cetera. Just as interesting as the demand side. What is going on sort of with the pointlessness, the seeming pointlessness of so many of these people's lives that they're turning uh, to these drugs. Very interesting thing that happens in these places too, again, is the retreat from marriage. Uh, the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia concluded, quote, the eroded power and presence of churches, unions, veterans organizations, athletic groups, and the lives of middle Americans has likely undercut many of the habits of the heart that would otherwise sustain strong marriages and families. So if you look at marriage, where it's dropped off, it hasn't been among the Wesleyan graduating elites. There's been a delay in marriage among college-educated people. But there's been a drop-off in marriage and a persistence high in divorce among the working class, among people who don't go to college. So in 1968, if you graduated from college, went to a little bit of college, or didn't go to college at all, you were just as likely at age 40 to be married. Nowadays, that has dropped from 86% for all three demographics down to about two-thirds of college-educated women are married at age 40 about 58% of those who went to some college, and less than 50% of women who graduate from high school but don't go to college are married at age 40. So the retreat from marriage in this country is a working class phenomenon. And I argue that it's a fallout from the fact that living the good life, building, raising a family, requires a sort of safety net um, that, uh, that you have if you're in a strong community. Um, we can talk about root causes. I think there's a lot of them. Hyper-individualism and over-centralization. They sound like opposites, right? Are we, are we too alone or are we too lumped together? But Tocqueville argued that those are flip sides of the same coin. That in a society where government, media, attention, economics are all overly centralized, we will, in fact, be cut off. The horizontal bonds between us and our neighbors, us and our friends, will be cut off while the, the centralizing bonds are strengthened. And sure enough, government over-centralization is, is one of the problems. Uh, one economist, a, a liberal economist, Jonathan Gruber, found that the New Deal, quote, crowded out at least 30% of church spending. In other words, in the places where New Deal, more money from the New Deal went, because of powerful politicians, not because of more need, but like where the Appropriations Committee chairman lived, et cetera, there was a greater reduction in the churches spending money on the poor, the hungry, the sick, and the homeless. They found that decreases in government expenditure, so in government retreats, that generally leads to significant increases in church activity. So a centralization of the safety net has led to an erosion of churches and other charitable organizations. So that's one of the root causes of the collapse of community. Also the centralization of our attention. Mass media draws our attention so that we know the names of obscure State Department officials who are testifying on the impeachment hearing, and we don't know the names of our city councilmen, our county councilmen, et cetera. We know, you know which political party we think we belong to or which congressman from another state is our favorite, but we don't know how to actually get the traffic light in our neighborhood changed. At the same time, there's hyper-individualism. Some of it is technology, that we're able to totally retreat from the world by staring at our phones. We're able to cultivate our own little unique uh, feed of media that takes away the sort of common bonds of, uh, of, of a shared culture that, uh, that can happen when, when culture and media, et cetera, are more shared. Um, I think the most important case of hyper-individualism uh, in this regard, though, is the sexual revolution. The idea that marriage is not a permanent thing entered into in front of and with a community and oriented toward child rearing, but 
becomes an individualistic thing, almost a contract, what you enter into for mutual benefit. And uh, that that has uh, gone hand in hand with the decoupling of sex, marriage, love, and child rearing. And just as uh, we need strong family, we need strong communities to build strong families, we need strong families to build strong communities. And the over-centralization economically as well, that main streets everywhere are, are losing, uh, losing what they have in the face of mega corporations who build malls that serve five different towns and you all drive there and you no longer have the serendipitous encounters where you run into your neighbors. Those undermine community. So we'll talk about a lot of this in the questions. And then there's the solutions. And this is where I'm going to admit, this is my weak point. I've, this is my third book. My, my uh, first book, one of the criticisms was that I went from like problem to problem to problem to the index. I, I didn't have a solutions chapter. So my second book, I tried to write a solutions chapter. I went back and I looked at it years later and they were all really bad ideas. It was like the gold standard or, or something like that. So I don't, I'm, I'm not great on it, but I'm gonna give you what I have before we move on to the questions. And like the, the Ten Commandments, many of my solutions are thou shalt nots more than thou shalt. So the first, stop trying to drive religion out of the public square. The previous administration sued an order of nuns called the Little Sisters of the Poor because they weren't providing contraception for their employees. Prominent Democratic presidential candidates this time around have said after to, to walk back their promises to take away the tax credentials of a church that didn't conduct gay marriages, they said, oh no, what you do behind your closed church doors is your business. But once you enter into the public square, Beto said, once you do that, once you start getting involved in education, hospitals, caring for the poor, that's when you have to play by our rules. So that's saying you may not be a religious institution in the public square if you're going to insist on following your conscience and your conscience disagrees with elite morality. So what they're trying to do is say, all of you religious institutions have to stop being civil society institutions. You have to stop being community hubs or you have to give up your consciences. You should go back when defending the, uh, the contraceptive mandate, Nancy Pelosi at one point said, look, I do my religion on Sundays. Now, you can't do your religion on Sundays if you are a Christian. You can't do your religion on Saturdays if you are an observant Jew. You can't do your religions for, you know, at noon on Fridays if you are an observant Muslim. To be a Christian, at least, is to live out your life according to the teachings of Christ. The, the, like the, one of my favorite parts of the Bible is the question, what, what are we to do if we want eternal life? And I like that because I feel like so many other questions Jesus gets are kind of like beating around the bush. But once somebody tells me, oh, by the way, you're either going to hell or you get eternal life, I'm going to be like, excuse me, please give me very specific examples of what I'm going to do if I'm going to get eternal life. And he gets asked that. And he's like, hey, love God and love your neighbor. Love your neighbor is what we're supposed to do. And we cannot do our religion on Sundays. And it annoyed me a lot when Obama would say, oh, we support the free freedom of worship. Freedom of worship is not in the Constitution. Free exercise of religion is in the Constitution. And for us to exercise our religion, we need to love our neighbor. Um, and we need to let churches be hubs and institutions of civil society. Why? So if you look at the cover of Alienated America, it's a shuttered church on the front. It's not a shuttered factory because the single most important hub of civil society in America is an for the middle class at least, and the working class, is and always has been church. If you ever read Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone, he said 50% of all civic activity begins in church or church-related institutions. That's what people in America who belong to things, if they're not in the elite classes, people in America who belong to things belong to church. So what has left all these people alienated? It's a secularization of America. So anything the government is doing, and it's not the government's fault, it's, it's largely the church's fault that we've had secularization and other, other factors, but 
we're talking about solutions. Anything the government is doing to drive religion out of the public square needs to stop. The sa safety net needs to be decentralized whenever possible. Make the federal government a safety net of safety nets is what I argue for. Then there's stuff, a, a term I came across recent years, intentional communities. Let me put it this way. Where we live in Montgomery County is a place built for cars. It's not built for humans. It's not walkable. That's bad for community. My wife and I, we have very robust social ties, but what do we do? We need two cars, um, especially after the Eve incident where I was running down Georgia Avenue with a stroller. We need two cars. Um, uh, we, we have enough money to afford two cars. We send our kids to excellent uh, parish school and girls' school and boys' school. We basically piece together through money and time and resources and my wife's connections growing up in this area, a robust net of, safe, of civil society. What if you don't have that? What if you're a single mom? What if you can't afford two cars? What if you can't afford one car? What if you don't have those resources in the background? A couple generations ago, it was easier to step outside, walk to the grocery store, let your kids ride their bikes around, and through that uh, way, build all these connections. The more that this world is built around cars, the more it takes immense effort and resources to build strong communities. Um, I'll, I'll race through it. Uh, we, I talk about local control of public schools. Uh, I talk about uh, unions need to be reformed. They should be an institution of civil society, but the current system doesn't allow for that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll make a quick note on public schools since this is, uh, since we're close to home. Um, where I grew up in New York, the towns actually control the public schools. It's not the same in Montgomery County. It's like this one size fits all thing. So this is, the, the easiest way to demonstrate this is when it snows a little bit in the winter, right? We would wake up and we would hear that Montgomery County schools were closed. Why? Because up in like Gaithersburg or whatever, Northwestern Maryland, which apparently is like north of the Northwestern Territories of Canada, would have like 15 feet of snow. And I look outside and like, there's barely a dusting out there. But all Montgomery County schools had to be closed. And my kids would think it was great, but I was like, you can't go sledding, there's no snow here. Like, what are we gonna do, trek up to Gaithersburg? I don't know if we can even get there in a day. It must be in, in another like ecosystem or something. And uh, that centralization was one aspect of it, but we have no control over our local, we live next door to a elementary elementary school, a public elementary school in our house, and we have no say over what happens at that public elementary school. If you have local control over public schools, suddenly that's where people, even if they don't belong to a church or whatever, that's where they have control, can exercise their political muscle. Man is a political animal. You're supposed to shape the world around you, and increasingly people can't. So, in the end, though, there's no big solution. I don't want to create the Federal Department of Community Cohesion. That would exacerbate centralization and undermine all of this. So who and what can fix it? So in the end, I'm going to bring the story back home a little bit. I had talked about our Cole Avenue and Kent Mill Road. The intersection of those is my parish, St. Andrews. If you show up at St. Andrews, um, there's a, a baseball backstop, and look behind it, there's a sign. And when I coach t-ball there, I teach the kids to throw by bouncing it off this sign. And then one day I finally read it. And it said, Detoli's Diamond. Mike Detoli was a guy who had just coached t-ball and youth baseball at St. Andrews. He died fairly young. I think he was in his 50s. But he had just done it year after year after year. And his name ended up behind our backstop. I thought about that as I was going on speaking tours about this book, because I was in Western Michigan, and there I saw basketball arenas named like Van Andel Arena or DeVos Center and all this stuff. The Van Andels and DeVosses are this, uh, you know, very successful Dutch families out in Western Michigan that what they did when they became multimillionaires and billionaires was they spent their money to build up institutions of civil society. And I thought, that's what we need. We need all the rich people to do that. And then I realized not everybody's going to be as wealthy as the Van Andels and DeVosses. But everybody can be like Mike DeToli. Everybody can be the guy, the mom, the neighborhood uh, woman or man who says, you know what I'm going to do with my time? 
I am going to go find an institution and build it up. I'm going to form an institution. Where my uh, wife grew up, it, it was bustling with kids when she was there. And then for years, when we started dating, there was no kids there. And now if you go back, it's absolutely bustling again. Why? Because a couple women who moved into that neighborhood deliberately went out of their way to walk around the neighborhood in strollers, to throw potlucks, to do everything. So when somebody said, I want to move to a place that's a good place to raise kids, it was that neighborhood. But what did they do? They made a place a good place to raise kids. So what's the solution? It's people going out and making more place a good place to raise kids. It's people going out and making sure that if there's anybody struggling with addiction, anybody who's going through a divorce, anybody whose parents has recently died, that it's more likely that they, not just through one-on-one -on -one uh, connections, but by belonging to something, will have the safety net there to support it. So that's, that when I, when I think about what's gonna, the solution gonna be, um, I look at that Mike DeToli sign, and then I look at a room like this. People willing to give up part of their night to come here a talk about what's wrong with the country, and I say, there isn't one big solution, there's 10,000 solutions, and I hope, I pray, that all of you in this room consider yourselves to be some of uh, the solution to this problem. Anyway, thank you very much. In your book, you, you talk about uh, Trump supporters. You talk uh, about a, a sort of a dichotomy in, uh, among religious mm -hmm. people and versus um, it, it, with respect to their support of Donald Trump. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so this is a, a real interesting thing. And again, what's happened since he got the nomination and since the general election is more complicated, but the simplest way to look at it is this. Before he locked up the nomination in early May and Ted Cruz and John Kasich dropped out, there was actually, the interesting correlations was if you said, how important is religion to you? the more religious people were more likely to support Donald Trump. But if you said, how frequently do you attend church, the less frequent attenders were more likely to support Donald Trump. So that could seem contradictory. Or among a lot of people I talked to, especially those who really didn't like Trump, said, ah, these are a bunch of hypocrite evangelicals. But I think, I think that's a wrong story. I think the people who belonged to things were the people who early on said, no, the American dream's not dead. I'm not getting on board with this. And the people who didn't belong to things, which could be very religious people, but who weren't part of a congregation for any reason. We can talk about theology of, of Southern evangelicals. We could talk about the economy and social structure of some parts of the Midwest. But for whatever reason, if you belong to something was a key. And the most important, easiest thing to belong to if you're middle class or working class is a church. So if you look, Robert Putnam wrote a follow-up to Bowling Alone called American Grace with uh, David Campbell, who's a, a Mormon at University of Notre Dame. And he, what they found was that at first they said, well, religious people are more likely to donate, more likely to volunteer, more like, and then they drilled further and they said, actually, these things only uh, ascribe to religious people to the degree that they attend church. Frequency of prayer, frequency, uh, expressed devotion, none of those correlate with these good outcomes. Going to church is what brings about the good uh, sociological outcomes in all regards. And then politically, going to church is what made people not agree that the American dream was dead, and by my analysis, then uh, not get on board with Trump in those early primaries. Do you have any thoughts on, so beyond saving souls, you, you talked about just now the, the Dutch uh, Reformed churches yeah. are planning communities. You said that planning communities. Are there things beyond saving souls that some churches do that perhaps other churches don't that, that pull people in? Um, yeah, the, oh, so when I came back from Salt Lake City I and I saw how the Mormon church ran things, I almost had to go straight to confession for, like, envy at how well they built community. Um, what the, the Mormons uh, do, so you... There was, I went to this place called the Bishop's Storehouse, and it's like a grocery store with no cash registers. 
And what happens is if you lose your job, you're, and ideally before you lose your job, you're about to lose your job, somebody in your local parish, uh, uh, the ward they call it, somebody in your ward comes and meets with you and talks to you and tries to help you. And then if you lose your job, suddenly they sit down and they say, okay, what do you have in your savings account? What do you literally have in your cupboard? Like, can you make it through two weeks feeding your family without, uh, without anything? And you say, okay, you know what? You're going to need some milk, but you can pay for that with your savings account. Two weeks later, they come back. You still don't have a job. What do you have, et cetera? Then you get a slip to go to the bishop's storehouse and get the groceries you need to feed your family while they try to help you find a job. But here's the thing. Who pays for all that food in the bishop's storehouse? Now I forget. It was once a month or once a week. Every family fasts for just one meal, which is a lot more than, than I, as a Catholic, fast. But yes, every family fasts for one meal. And they calculate how much money they saved by not eating that one meal. And they donate that to fund the bishop's storehouse. So if you're there eating food from the bishop's storehouse, you know your neighbors literally went hungry for a short period so that you could make it through this downturn. So that's a very deliberate uh, thing that they did. On the, on the Dutch reform it's interesting because they're almost the opposite theologically when it comes to the value of good works and the Mormons, right? There's actually a teaching about good works bringing about salvation, in, as far as I understand it, in the, in the LDS church. But you go over to the Dutch Reform, and they're as like anti, you know, uh, as Calvinist as you get in saying this isn't how you get any justification, salvation, etc. And so, but they still do a much better job at these, this aspect of the corporal works of mercy than just about anybody else. Why is that? Well, one thing that's in common between both of them is the sort of pilgrim nature of these churches, the refugee nature of these churches, that they were, tra there's a lot of traveling together, setting up on the frontier. And when you're in a situation of hardship like that, you're going to necessarily be more communal. Utah, the state, uh, little uh, logo is a beehive. And that's a very Mormon symbol of everybody who's doing their part and building it up. So maybe there's something to the, uh, uh, maybe there's something to that aspect of that, the frontiersman aspect, where we think of frontiersmen as rugged individual, but really it means, no, you really need your neighbors if you're out there in the, in the middle of nowhere in western Michigan in 1850, et cetera. Maybe the, the church acting as kind of the shepherd. Um, yes. Uh, maybe you could touch on just quickly the, the uh, you note in your book that there was conflicting interpretations of, of um, the vote in the 2016 primaries in terms of uh, income, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so this was an interesting thing. You could see on the same day in two different publications, two various different headlines, who are these Trump voters? One set of headlines, one was um, Trump voters are, um, you know, poor, there are more foreclosures, etc. But then you would see if you went over to a place like Vox.com, um, uh, you know, economic anxiety didn't drive the Trump vote, racism did. And the latter set would say, if you look at exit polls, the individuals who voted for Trump had above average income, below average for a Republican primary voter, but above average for the nation. The individuals who voted for Trump were uh, more likely to be retired, less likely to be unemployed, et cetera. So they actually have nothing to complain about. If they're claiming it's about losing factory jobs, it's just that they're upset that there are too many Hispanics in America or something like that. So I said, how can you have these two contradictory studies? This one is saying, wherever there's more foreclosures, there's more Trump. Wherever there's more men out, out of the labor force, there's more Trump vote. Wherever there's more, and then I realized the two different classes. The ones that said Trump voters are doing just fine were measures of individuals. The ones that said there's real struggle going on here were measures of places. And if you believe that there's a human nature and you believe man is a, a political animal, you have to realize you can't understand individuals outside of community. You can't understand us unplaced. You can't understand us just on rows and columns on a, a spreadsheet or anything like that. People are 
who they are is, is hugely dependent on where they are and what the place is like. So the people who lived in places that were collapsing were the people who were the folks who came out of the woodwork, who had never voted before, or who were Democrats or independents before. They were the ones who first rallied to Trump when he said the American dream is dead. So it wasn't that they were on opioids. It wasn't that they were poor. It wasn't that they had dropped out of the labor force. It was that they were surrounded by people who had, and they looked around and they said, my community is broken. Yes, the American dream is dead. But if you, when he said the American dream is dead, I looked around me, I was like, my American dream's not dead. I'm here, you know, coaching t-ball and my friends at work all like me and we're going to a birthday party and all that stuff. And, and I didn't, it's easy to take for granted that uh, those things are immensely valuable. And then it's easy to ignore, if you take that for granted, it's easy when you see people who said, wait a second, you are making $70,000 a year living in Western Michigan. What are you complaining about? And then it's only when you visit and you really dig deep that you see they live in places where people don't know their neighbors, people don't belong to things, and there are fewer things to even belong to. Um, last question from me. Uh, you, you talked about liberal elites practicing what conservatives preach. Uh, stepping back a little further, is, is, it, is part of the problem here, maybe part of the solution, that we've stopped talking about virtue um, in the public square? I really do think it's part of it, and I'm glad you said virtue, because I talk a lot about virtue in the book, in part because Aristotle's definition of virtue is that virtue is a habit. Habits take practice. They take training. Practicing something takes practice ground. If you want to be a good basketball player and you don't have a hoop to shoot on, you're going to be in trouble. If you're growing up in a place where there's not strong communities, um, it's going to be harder to exercise the muscles to build up those virtues. But I would say this, that um, when you look in places where, again, the elite communities where everybody finishes school, gets a job, gets married, has kids, etc., um, if you ask them about that, they say, well, this is what made sense for us, and frankly, this is kind of best practices. So what you and I would call virtues, they call best practices, because, oh, well, your kid is more like, all the data that I give there, your kid is more likely to do well, less likely to get pregnant as a teenager, more likely to finish high school if you put them in clubs, if you do that. It's almost like following a, a rule book and with no sort of moral agency attached to it, and maybe they'll get as good outcomes for their kids, but if they're not willing to articulate it, and if these are the people who are then the anchors and the editors and the congressmen and the mayors, and they're not willing to say, actually, there is a better way to live and there is a worse way to live. And finishing school and then getting a job doesn't have to be college. Finish high school or college, get a job, then get married, then have kids. Try to do things in this way. And we're going to try to build a community that makes it easier to do that. That's a problem. But again, that last part is why I don't want to say put too much emphasis on the preaching. I think the main reason that people are retreating from family formation is not that they're just getting the message that it's fine to have babies out of wedlock, et cetera. It's that raising children is hard, and we need communities to support us. And places like Oostburg and places like Chevy Chase have those communities, and places like Uniontown don't. So the preaching is a good and important part, but the more important part is the building the infrastructure that makes family formation more accessible. Okay, let's, uh, we'll take questions and then... Uh, yeah. It's hard for them to see, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick the... Uh, there, there we go. Hi, okay, thank you so much for IHE hosting this event and for writing this very important book. Um, I'm curious, you know, earlier this week we had a, a public figure on this campus talking about the importance of community and family. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on Senator Rubio's speech earlier this week. Um, so Rubio is one of those guys who I think, like me, had an understanding of conservatism that was rattled a bit by Donald Trump's uh, victory. And in some ways, there was a, a libertarian streak, I think, 
of, well, government doesn't have a role in any of this stuff that I still hold on to. I don't know if Rubio does as much, but what he has tried to say, and I only saw you know some highlights, et cetera, from, from what Rubio said, but um, what he is trying to say is that th there's too much of conservatism that is focused on maximizing GDP and maximizing economic growth when that's at best a means to an end. And that what is very valuable, more valuable, is um, is family, family formation, and uh, and community. So from again the the brief bits of, of highlights, et cetera, that I saw, I think that's a positive development as long as we understand that the central government can't bring about these goods. But to the degree that central government is making choices, often it's choosing between time with your kids or time at work. To the degree that the tax code or anything is doing that, we shouldn't just say, oh, let's have more time at work. Like, you know, Kamala's pra uh, proposal to have kids spend more time in, in school. And I was just thinking, if you think the government's in the role of like tweaking and micromanaging our lives like that, why not do something to allow more stay-at-home moms? But if Senator Rubio said, I'm going to propose a bill that's going to subsidize more stay-at-home moms. I, as a conservative, would say, we have no idea what the unintended consequences of that is going to be, okay? So I'd be, I'd be kind of uh, skeptical of that. Hello. So I find your analysis compelling. Um, but, you know, one thing I would like to add to it is that, uh, so your analysis is based on the fact that institutions are in a crisis, and wherever they are in crisis, there are those consequences that you mentioned. But I am concerned that there are very powerful forces out there that are actually accelerating the crisis in these institutions. Uh, let me give you an example. We are a Catholic university here, so, uh, you know, any um, uh, example of a uh, child abusing priest which is totally deplorable, of course, but gets a lot of press. But there's no mention of those thousands of um, you know, Catholic priests who do a lot of good in their community, who sometimes even give their lives uh, to, to do something good for the rest of mankind. And so there's powerful forces out there that uh, are undermining deliberately for their own uh, ends our faith in institutions. So what can we do to counter those forces? So my full-time job is as a journalist. And for that reason and other reasons, I think maybe I see this differently than you do. If there's lots of facts that are breeding distrust in, the institu in an institution, I see two responses. One is, maybe we shouldn't trust that institution. And two is, we need to fix that institution. With the church, the first isn't a good option. And so we need to fix it. And so I spend approximately 0% of my time complaining about the disproportionate coverage of priest abuse scandals because it's infinitely worse when a priest does it than when a public school teacher does it. Because I, as a Catholic, have to look out for my own house. And I have to make sure that there's zero sentiment of defense or apology for not just the abuse, but the cover-ups and, and that sort of thing. So I don't think the coverage of the abuse and the coverage of the cover-up is a problem. Trust me, I spend tons of time complaining about the media coverage of religion. But when the media is exposing, or when a state attorney general in Pennsylvania is exposing what the bishops covered up, even if I think it might be a little bit unfair, I'm going to say it is better to have that brought to light. So I think, A, the institutions have to get their act in order. Um, and then we can start saying, hey, stop. I mean, I, and I always say, I say day and day, do not drive us out of the public square. And then somebody says, how can you still 
love and trust your church considering what's happened. And I say, and this is back to the question of subsidiarity, I encounter the church at that intersection of Arcola and Camp Mill. I encounter that church at the altar of my parish and in the t-ball field of my parish. So that's sort of the, the way that, that I look at restoring trust in the church, is that on a parish-by-parish parish basis, we can make individuals say, you can come and love and trust and live in this parish. But then when it comes to the abuse that's happened in the hierarchy, and there, now there's new stories of economic, suggesting economic uh, financial abuse in Rome, etc. Our job should be to go into that temple and overturn the tables. It should not be to say, hey, let's not be unfair. There, there's too much going on. So, yeah, the media does a lot, and the politicians do a lot to undermine us. But where we are clearly wrong, I think we have to be the first ones to run in there and overturn the tables and, uh, and get the filth out of the temple. Thank you. That was a great presentation and, of course, very sympathetic. Anybody who loves Tocqueville is, you know, is my guy. But uh, uh, I have a basic question. I wonder if it's too naive, but what's the American dream? <laughs> Maybe because it's buying often, a big house. No. Right. Because of it, I mean, it's the sense, the, the belief that you will do better than your parents, in the sense that this is the land of opportunity, there will be a continual improvement, and it's very economic uh, in, in a way. Uh, and, and what you're really emphasizing is the importance of the community relationships and all that. Yeah. And in a sense, like, perhaps we need a different sense of the American dream. I don't know. I wonder if you could think a bit more about the relationship between that social structure and yeah. the economic goal and what we're what people are really missing and what they're alienated about. Yes. No, that, that's right. I th what I try to do throughout the book, um, and I say in the, in the preface after talking about uh, Eve and the hospital, I say, if this book does its job, it will bend your understanding of the American dream. That what it is, is that, I mean, frankly, that moment where that week, where we're drowning in food, and the moment where my wife is just, Lucy, you're going to get home. One of these kids is going to, one of these adults is going to give you a ride home. Um, and why is that the American dream? Because Tocqueville lays out that we build more institutions, build more little platoons than anybody else does. And we do it in a decentralized way. In other words, lots of, all of Europe, et cetera, will have all sorts of um, things. But if, if Tocqueville's to be trusted, we do it more and at more levels than anybody else. So the American dream that I try to arrive at by the end of the book, um, well, first of all, that, that economic mobility is a fruit of the fact that you belong to so many things. So go to Holland, Michigan, for instance, and there's gonna be people who will have a local pub or a local McDonald's, and that's something they belong to. And then they also belong to their first Christian Reformed Church, which is a different church than the Reformed Church of America, but both the Christian Reformed Church and the Reformed Church of America will end up on the same Little League team. And their boss, who runs in different social circles because he's a millionaire CEO, he's actually in the pew next to them in that church. So the, the belonging to so many different things at so many different levels that are overlapping, um, that I think is sort of a, a uniquely American thing, that there is something um, that... We, you know, and the other, the weird thing about Europe is how they have sort of this lack of state church separation, yet a total evisceration of the church. Now, it's not contradictory in my mind. I think it goes hand in hand, but it can be surprising at first blush. Well, we have a real separation, that there's a secular government, but the, the communities that form the government were built up largely to be sort of religious. So you go to these strong places, and even the secular ones, the elite places, people belong to so many different things, they overlap. That's what I would describe as the American dream, the ability to form, belong to, join multiple different things. You're going to have 12 different allegiances, and some of them are going to almost seem to clash with others, and that the, the image of the melting pot is not the one I like. I like an image of a quilt work or a patchwork, that sort of thing, where there's so many different colors adjacent to each other, um, and, and they're different. So that, that immense diversity and pluralism that we have, that you can belong to things, start things, be different, 
um, by, from your neighbors while still belonging to a joint uh, venture with them. That's what I try to steer the American dream towards, which is not a, a common definition, but it is, I think, where Tocqueville and uh, Kirk and Burke pointed. It's shaping the world around you. Yes. And, and, and so that's the thing. So man is a political animal. So I, I, what I didn't tell up here was uh, the story I tell in the book of camping out at Occupy Wall Street. I don't know if any of you guys remember Occupy Wall Street from 2011. And it just happened to be a friend of mine from high school was getting married in New York. And, um, and my wife and I went up there for a couple nights. And on the way, on the train ride up, I was like, you know what's going on? Occupy Wall Street. So maybe we could save on a hotel room. No, Katie nixed that. But then on the, on the third day, I was like, why don't you go back? And, I, and she was really pregnant with one of our kids. And I said, you go back. I'll get you a first class train ticket. I'm going to go and camp out with Occupy Wall Street. And the weather was perfect. I didn't even need a tent. I just had a pillow. And when I talked to the people there, First, I was, I was excited. I was like, I'm going to find overlap with these people. Because I was a guy who opposed the bank bailouts. They opposed the Iraq war. I was like, so what do you hear protesting? And they said, we're protesting how Wall Street and big business has too much power. I said, okay, now great. And so what specifically are you protesting? Well, that then they're crowding out the voices of the people. Okay, they have too much power. They're crowding out the voices of the people. What do they do? They get behind closed doors and they make all the decisions. Okay, the doors are closed. Smoke-filled room. Big business, big banks, government. You're locked outside. What's the decision in that room you don't like? Opposing campaign finance reform. And I was just like, come on, give me something. And I thought it was like a protest about nothing. But then I'm lying there, not sleeping. And I get up and I go and I look at all the signs as the sun starts rising. I realize most of them were about, we want to have a voice in politics. Now, of course, they wanted to somehow lobby to pass some bill in Washington and but we want to have a voice in politics as we are political animals, right? We want to, as you put it, shape the world around us. And that's what we always get to do as Americans, or we always ought to get to do. But it depends on these institutions, on local government or on little, uh, little platoons. I always say that the way I've, there's two ways I've most shaped the world around me. They're both now visible if you go on Google Maps and look at the, the satellite view. One is that the intersection right by our house, we realized there should be a right turn lane and there wasn't, and we lobbied the state, the county government and they changed it. The other is that at our parish, if you look from the satellite view, you now see a baseball diamond. It wasn't there, it's was totally overgrown and the soccer players loved it and stuff. But I said, no, we should have a baseball program. We should have youth baseball, we should have t-ball. There's no way I could have made a baseball diamond. There's no way I could have made even a baseball or t-ball team. But with an institution sort of at my fingertips and other people who had the resources and money, there's a Catholic University groundskeeper guy who was a guy who sort of did all the actual infield work. The institutions of the parish or of the county government gave me the ability to shape the world around me. And that's really an American dream thing that you don't see that idea that the average citizen is going to take responsibility to shape their community as much. I'm interested in asking you about the future, maybe, of the Republican Party in light of what you were talking about tonight and then the election results a couple of days ago. In one way, the voters that have come out to support the president are not necessarily Republican voters. I mean, they're, they're linked to the president, but they're not, they haven't, the data is at least unclear that they're translating and voting for Republicans. On the other hand, many suburban voters across the country have you know typically been Republican Romney voters or Rubio voters in 16. They've sort of moved away from the party, at least in the short term. Not clear whether that's a long-term consequence or not. In, li in light of the last couple of days and your research going around the country, have you found anyone who's finding a way to sort of merge those two groups together? And, and mm -hmm. just to add to that, because the comments from Senator Rubio just came up, is the model really for a future Republican Party out at the mayoral level or the county executive level? And did you find someone there that might be offering the future of the party, bringing these branches together, as opposed to what Senator Rubio is saying, Senator Hawley is saying, et cetera? Yes, yeah, so I think it's really interesting what's going on. And we'll, at the Washington Examiner commentary page, a lot of what we try to do and what Josh Hawley and Rubio are trying to do, again, is learn something from, like I did with the book, learn something from the 2016 election. Our country is not what we thought it was because two-party politics can obscure things. 
And it's funny, half of the vote Trump won was what we used to call the evangelical vote in parts of Iowa, while what Cruz won is the other half of what we used to call the evangelical vote. And it turns out that there's an evangelical vote that was voting for Santorum and Huckabee, but then there's also a populist, a white populist vote that was voting for that, and that was a split. So we learned our country was different from what it is. But you're exactly right, and I've written two columns after each election day in the last two years on how um, Trump made independents and, and Democrats into Trump voters, but he hasn't made them into Republicans. And part of it is that what they're signing up for was not a policy of low taxes. It wasn't even a pro-life uh, policy or anything like that. It was the expression that the American dream is dead because the game is rigged against you. And Rubio and Hawley are trying to feel their way around to forming that into a more coherent, articulate, not that our, our president falls short on the scores of coherence and articulateness, um, but into a more articulate and coherent uh, philosophy. The problem is that every policy proposed by Josh Hawley, I think, is a bad one. I mean, regulating Facebook or whatever. Tucker Carlson said we should ban teenagers from having, Congress should ban teenagers from having social media accounts. I think these are mostly bad because they're looking for big central solutions. And when we see a nationwide problem, it's perfectly rational to say we should have a nationwide solution. But again, that was never the American infrastructure. The American structure was we have a nationwide idea that gets manifested on the local level in the strong institutions of civil society. So I was, I was mentioning a guy just, a writing candidate just won as the mayor of uh, East Liverpool, Ohio, an opioid ravaged town um, uh, near Youngstown. And so that would be an interesting question. Does he, he's a Republican, he beat a long-term incumbent Democrat, is he gonna come and say what we need in this town is churches and clubs and organizations. We need people who come and know their neighbors and build it up that way. Um, or is he just going to try to pump in as much state money to you know, build an attractive waterfront? That's, that, I think, is going to be the question for the next generation. And one of the reasons I don't give a bunch of answers is because it's going to be different in every community. In Pittsburgh, I think building up the waterfront really did do a good job of making it be a better place to raise kids. But in a lot of other places, I've, the book tour has brought me in contact with all these people who their life is the solutions that I say I'm poor at. And one woman just said, no program ever helped somebody. Relationships help people. So if you're the mayor of East Liverpool, are you able to go and say, I'm going to get more people into more relationships? Is there something you could do to bring that about? And if the Republican Party became the party of, yeah, we're going to connect people who are suffering with their neighbors, somehow, I don't quite see the policy platform on how to do that, but if they became that, then that would be the best possible way that they could learn a lesson from the fact that, uh, that Trump won saying the American dream has been killed. Yeah, I, the, the Trump's election is, is fascinating. Um, and to me, what he did is, is he went out, he went out to the alienated American and he said to them, I'm going to fight for you. And that was the first issue. And I, I will fight for you. And he convinced them that he, that he will. And I think that's really what distinguished him from the other uh, Republican presidents. Yep. I mean, the, the other candidates. Yeah. yeah, I agree. So uh, thank you, all of you, for, for attending tonight, and thank you, Tim Carney. Uh, again, we'll have a book signing over here and a reception over here. So please stick around. Thank you. Thank you.